Now more than ever, self-empowerment is the only way out of this mess, I believe. It's not protesting in the street. I understand the frustration. I understand the anger. But that hasn't helped in 50 years. It's not going to start helping now. If anything, it's going to push the agenda faster into martial law and into what whoever the powers that be are, into what they want. So now is the time to take that same energy, that same fire that we have, and take it off the streets and take it into businesses and take it into corporations, take it into building more and building with each other and amongst each other. And it's not a black thing, it's a, it's a, it's a human thing. It's everybody doing it together. I think hip hop will always be a void for the people. Uh, Chris Paul and Don Newkirk, thank you very much for joining us in this conversation. No uh, we have a we are Ambrosia for Heads. I'm Reggie Williams, founder of Ambrosia for Heads, and we got Jake Payne, our editor in chief. And we launched this podcast called What's the Headline? Um, and this is, I think, episode 10 or 11, something like that. Oh, yeah. wow. Okay. And you guys are our second guests. You know, um, we had wow, Havoc, nice. we had Havoc come on for oh, uh, Havoc, dope, Ooh, the 20th dope. anniversary of Mob Deep. But it's a real, real pleasure to have you guys, uh, you know, join us. So, thank you, thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, man, for real. Yeah, yeah. So we're here to discuss your project. Uh, you all scored uh, the current Netflix documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? And you're releasing a, an album in conjunction with that, which curates some of the music by every means necessary. So, you know, Malcolm said, by any means necessary. KRS said, by all means necessary. Why did you guys choose by every means necessary? <laughs> this is best suited for new pair. <laughs> the domain was available. <laughs> <laughs> but we did age. also figure, we did also figure, you know, it would break up some of the noise of by any means necessary. Yeah. You know, if you search that, you're going to get a myriad of things. And then, you know, KRS did have by all means necessary. So we figured, I happened to say it to Paul, I said, we're going to have to go with something else other than any, like, maybe by every means necessary. And he said, oh, that's it. He said, don't overthink it. That's it right there. Go with that. Yeah. And that's what we went with. Yeah. Well, it fits, you know. So Malcolm died 50 years ago. And, you know, Oof. a lot of his messages, as we are seeing today, like in real time, are just as relevant now as they were in the 60s. Wow. But how, do you, how, how, do you, how do you convey that anger, that pain, the frustration through uh, instrumental music? Well, well if, I mean, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kurt. Uh, no, 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 I was saying you go ahead. Oh, no, I mean, you know, the, a good thing that, that helps us, and, and you can relate to this, is we're all born off of the civil rights movement. So we know the residuals of when we're younger, at least I remember when I was younger, just kind of the slight tension and kind of the feel. Um, you know, definitely all the civil rights movement has done, but not fully brought us to a point of total harmony and total peace. So we kind of, from growing up, could feel the strife, the anger, and the pain. And then having the documentary to fall back on and look at and, and really um, look at Malcolm's struggles and what he had to deal with, and not just that, his, 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 his killing, that definitely gave us an option just to, not an option, but a chance to actually look at and, and timeline and chronicle all he was feeling you know, up to his death. So that, like I said, seeing it, partially living it, helped us able to, to score and, and, you know, and, and grab that feeling. Um, and, you know, one thing about scoring is, man, you take music out of any movie, anything, sometimes, even though the words are powerful, it definitely doesn't drive it home as much as when you have a <laughs> or something mm. like sad or whatever. So, us looking at him and what he was doing drove that feeling out of us. And so, like I so said, once you take the picture, the dialogue out, that's what you're left with. And that's what we were able to, to draw from. Mm -hmm. How about you, Don? Um, <clears throat> definitely echoing what Paul said. Um, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's pretty unfortunate, actually, that 50 years later, you know, 
it almost, if you look around, especially right now, it looks like nothing's changed. It might even looks like, you know, it, it's gotten worse actually. Um, so it, it, being that that's the case, and even though this wasn't happening right now, you know, with the protests in the street and the whole COVID thing and, you know, um, the senseless killing of black men and women over and over and over that we have to witness, that wasn't going on when we were scoring it, but you can't, it never leaves your consciousness. It's always there, you know, right in the back of your mind, right in, in the back of your subconscious. So it, it definitely makes it a little bit easier in the sense to connect, but harder in the sense because you have to connect to be able to make the music. You know what I mean? You have to really connect with you know, all the injustices. So yeah. it's kind of crazy. You know, there was a song and I'm not sure which one it was. I, I didn't have the full track listing, but uh, it was, I think it may have been Black Messiah or What's in the Name, but mm -hmm. um, there's a voice saying, somebody asked me, is this revolution going to be the all out war against the current power structure? Right. But it could be the one because I'm a revolutionary, AKA the revolutionist. I participate, advocate, meditate, total revolution in each and every state. You know, that when I, when I listened to that last night, it gave me chills to be listening to it right now. And you say you didn't, wow. write, you say you didn't write it like uh, recently. When, first of all, who, who was that voice and when was that written? Um, that voice is actually my brother. Okay. That's it's my brother, right. Salim. Okay. Um, and this was kind of like a throwback to Paul and I's first group. Our first group was called the Soul Brothers, which was Paul, my brother, our boy Mike T, and myself. Um, and when we were doing the project, we wanted it to be instrumental. But at some point, you know, we wanted to have something ring out throughout the tracks vocally. But we didn't want to do like the average everyday features. Oh, we got this person and that person on the album. You know, so again, Paul and his genius, man, he said, hey, maybe we should ask your brother to uh, write some stuff, you know, just some thoughts to put down. He said, you know, just kind of right up his alley because he's definitely, I think all of us are revolutionary mindset. It, you know, I, I don't think you, in a, in a sense, you can't help but be in America if you're a black man. You know what I mean? There has to be some level of revolution in your consciousness. My brother definitely was the one that sparked it in me as a youth. Um, so I asked him, and at first he said no. He's like, oh, I don't know about that. And I was like, man, like, just think about it. Like, you know, it'd be really dope to have you in the project. And then a while later, he came back. He said, all right, I'll do it. He, asked, he said, I actually wrote some stuff. And I recorded him separately. We didn't record him to the music. And when he was spitting this stuff out, right here in the room, man. I was like sitting there like, like, whoa, this is heavy, man. And I was like, man, Paul was so right. Cause Paul was like, you know, your brother has a way of bringing words across. Plus he has a voice. He was like, your brother has a very commanding, powerful voice. So it would just be dope. And you know, this is so crazy, man, because just when you were reiterating it just now, just hearing the words coming out of someone else's mouth and thinking about what I see on the internet all day or on TV, it is really, it gave me chills just listening to you reiterate it, actually. And, um, you know, it's wild. It's like we couldn't have planned it any better, but we didn't plan it. You know what I mean? It's, and that's, again, it's just the unfortunate nature of it all. It would be great to be like, oh, we're geniuses. We, we figured out, you know, we were ahead of the time. But the fact is, is that we're never ahead of your time because it's continuously, the times are continuously repeating themselves. So I'm yeah. going on and on to say, no. you know, And that's, that. That, that's another thing that's, that's, that's highlighted on the album where, you know, he points out that revolution means it goes round and round and round, you know, because it keeps recurring. You know, so Paul, you had a reaction when I read those words too. How do they sit with you right, right now, given what's going on? I mean, it, it's, 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 like Newkirk said, and as we say, we echo each other. Uh, it seems very prophetic, but it, it is just what we live through. So for his brother to draw those words, 
uh, and, and bring up at a time before what we're going on now means he's felt this all along. You know, it's not anything contrived. It's not anything that, you know, well, I, I just need something to say. It's something in his gut. And that's part of the reason why I asked him for to get his brother, because I always felt his brother was genius, but also his thinking is, 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 uh, is something that you look and you go, wow, I never looked at it like that. Or maybe I did look at it that way, but I could never verbalize it that way, you know? And, and there, there's definitely a brilliance. And I'm glad we had a chance to, to showcase his, his thoughts and, um, and his talents. And like, just like Newkirk said, after hearing you say it, it, it I'm not gonna say it takes on a different meaning, but it's like, whoa, that's really deep in light of everything that's going down. Like it's, these are, these are really intense times. I mean, in, in a billion years, I, I, I would have thought people were getting a little less hands-on, you know, because it, it seems like, you know, you get the people getting comfortable and I'm gonna do an online petition. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For me to vocalize this and put myself out there. I like my cushy job, I like whatever. But, you know, I guess there's a whole lot of stuff going around. I mean, you, you got the coronavirus and people realize, like, you're not promised tomorrow. You know, like, you, you, the time is now. Like, you got to make your moves. Um, and, you know, I might not have the Christian job. I might not even have, you know, I've lost my mom. I lost my brother. Now I got to deal with a cop beating on me and trying to kill me. Like, it's, you're backed up against a wall, you know. And this is, uh, just to make a long story short, his brother's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's very brilliant too. I always looked up to him. You know, so Paul, you'll be, so Paul, you'll be happy to know he's he's back making music again steadily. Hmm. Ah, fantastic. see, there it is. See, yeah. that's dope. You know, and listening to it, you know, for me, um, and I'm curious if you can confirm this. I heard like you know influences from Gil Scott Heron. Last Poets, you know, uh, it, it struck me with that kind of vibe, which also shows how, you know, cyclical this is. But is, is that where he kind of drew inspiration in it? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, he knows about Last Poets and knows about Gil Scott, just like all of us doing everything. Um, but like Paul said, that's just his come from. Mm. He just off the head damn near half the time. Like it, it, he he um recorded the first initial part of what he had, and I said, man, we need a little bit more. And um, he said, well, that's all I wrote. I said, well, we just need a little bit more. Can you go back, and, you know, just pen something else? And a day later, he came back and was like, okay, I got more. And so his his he doesn't even have to like, I don't know, man. It's just my brother's <clears throat> ill, man. He's 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 got me by five years. He's five years older than me. So I always felt pretty honored because I would have the jump. I'd have like five years of a jump on a lot of my friends because, you know, he would hand me information. He would study and hand it back to me and be like, check this out. And I'd be like, whoa, like, did you get this? And, you know, it was just the perfect big brother opportunity. But yeah, his, I think it's just all the years of all the knowledge he's accumulated over the years and what he sees going on and just how he feels. He's able to just, you know, articulate it damn me off the head mm. and uh yeah i think i think he should do a full album of it yeah absolutely <laughs> really. absolutely it'd be very timely now you know so you, you talked about needing to have uh some vocals on there you know how does the, the creation process differ when you're creating music for a film or a pre-existing product rather than something that's just your own your own original conception well i think for us uh is obviously you're trying to get the vibe, the feel, and the sentiment of what's going on as you're seeing it. You know, going off the top and just making your own music, it's whatever your gut is, whatever you're feeling at the time. This, we're looking at, okay, man, Malcolm's going through this pivotal time in his life. He knows he's, you know, people are trying to kill him. How would I feel in that situation? How, how would I guess he's feeling in that situation? And how do we bring that across musically? And you're really trying to push that feeling and really going inside yourself. So the beautiful thing about scoring and and kind of putting that those emotions across and it, it it's it's really having a good understanding of yourself because you I mean and, and others so I mean you, you can't just look at a scene and go man I don't know how that would feel <laughs> you know what I'm saying I'm, I'm gonna do some circus music you know so it it it, it uh it, it gives you the opportunity to be very uh, introspect 
and disrespectful. And, and at the same time, it, it's good for uh, me and Newkirk too, because in relaying those feelings and for us knowing each other for so long, like, man, I've known this guy since I was 14 years old. So, you know, there's times we, we could look at a piece of film or look at something and say how it rather reminded us of uh, something that happened when we was 15, something happened when we was 16, remember the time that, uh, and, and then at that point, how does that come across musically? Oh, remember the time when uh, the, 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 the tire got flat on the car? Oh, yeah. How did you feel then? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so it, it works all the way around musically for us to, to look at something, be able to relate to each other, and then put it out so it, it reinforces what you're watching. Uh, and then we were very fortunate to be able to take that music out of the element, out of the... Uh, the, the, the realm of video and have it stand on its own. And to us, that was very, very important because, you know, you could, especially scoring music, you know, you could like, oh God, this is, uh. but, you know, citing an example of, and I'm, I'm going to stop rambling, is uh, like Curtis Mayfield, you know, Superfly or, or Shaft, when you, you take uh, uh, Isaac Hayes, that music works out of the, the realm yeah. of the score of the film as well and we were thinking of that we was like yo it's it's melodies it's it's themes it's vibes and then we're able to have it live with live, live within the uh the realm and uh and, and the world of the video and outside the world of, of, the, of the video and you could still have the same feeling without seeing the video and that took that took some uh took some thought you know, I remember like a dozen years ago, I went to see this documentary here in Philly and it was called Pressure Cooker on, you know, yeah. kids. And I remember afterwards, Dawn, that was the first time that you and I had connected. I reached out to you on your website mm -hmm. because I see mm -hmm. the whole movie, which is a very lighthearted, inspirational film, only to realize that both of you had scored it. So how does, how does the tone of the film shape the sounds and the melodies and the tempo of the music you guys are making when you compare something like that to something like this, which is, you know, more serious and maybe more personal? Uh, I it definitely, it, it, it's everything actually. You know, the, the, I mean, that's the whole purpose of scoring is to highlight and to accent, you know, that which is on the screen. So the cool thing about Pressure Cooker, which was dope, is as light as it is, we tried to still bring some level of seriousness across because of the teacher because she was so like dead ass serious about you know yeah. getting her kids scholarships and getting them into college you know she kind of had to buy every and any means necessary type of <laughs> approach yeah, also yeah. you know what i mean as loving as yeah. she is like when i met her she's just so warm and loving and everything but um she didn't play at all <laughs> in the classroom so we wanted to keep it you know light and fun, but at certain times we also, you know, made sure we wanted to get across the emotion of it too. So definitely the film, the, 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 the optics definitely always dictate what we're doing uh, musically, whether it's, you know, Pressure Cooker or, or Pootie Tang or, you know. Pootie. <laughs> or um, Who Killed Malcolm X. And with Malcolm, yeah. it was definitely you know, the, the lens is just so much heavier, you know, coming from that. It's so, so many emotions, so many layers of, of emotion and so many layers of intricacy with Malcolm's story that that's what made us dig that much deeper. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it definitely is everything. It plays the complete role of everything. Yo, can, can I add something to that real quick? Of course. Uh, you know, and, and, and it, you know, pressure cooker was definitely something we had to tackle and was early on in, in, in our scoring, you know, we, we scored a few things before that, like Newkirk said, Pudu Tang, and we did this thing called The Best Thief. Uh, it was on Showtime, then, right, Newkirk? Yep. Yep, came on Showtime. So we did that. Um, but the, the thing that about Malcolm X too that I meant to add is when we got offered to do this project, it's – it weighed a lot on us because we felt we had to do this serious justice. You, you know, it's like, man, this is Malcolm X, this is killing. Like, you know, it's an honor to, to, to be able to do this, but yo, we gotta come with it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we don't expect to ever come less, but it was like, you know, this is a very important film. 
you know, and it's something that we have to be very intricate, very thoughtful, pull deep within and get it right. Where a lot of, uh, you know, some of the other stuff, it's we're able to pull from a lighter side, which is, which is uh, easier, yeah. <laughs> I have to say, you know, because that's, that's who we are. We're like, ah, <laughs> this, you know. Yeah. This you got to think at the time, like, man, remember they stole your bicycle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's coming from a different place. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you mentioned uh, Curtis Mayfield and Superfly and, and you know, Isaac Hayes with Shaft. This also had a sound, it sounded like, you know, contemporaneous with, 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 with that time period. How did you guys achieve that? That was definitely what we wanted to, um, we set out to do that. That was when we sat down and talked about it with the, um, the, the directors um, and amongst ourselves and, um, and, and with the music supervisor with Barry Cole, that was the main thing. We were like, you know, between ourselves, we were, Paul, Paul especially was like, look, this needs to have a vibe, you know what I mean? So it doesn't feel like hokey and can. It needs to have a vibe. And, you know, and we, it's cool because, like, we know each other so well. We both were in the same mindset. We were, both, <clears throat> we were both, like, if we could capture that 70s, late 60s vibe, early 70s vibe, um, that would punctuate, we thought at least it would punctuate the style of what, you know, the, the documentary was trying to get across at the same time. What we didn't want was to have, like, these heavy scenes with like the Nation of Islam and Malcolm and then a trap beat <laughs> to, to, to totally take your attention away from, you know, we didn't want to like, we didn't want the music to, to be a distraction. Right. You know what I mean? And we felt like if we made it too contemporary, you know, in this time, which is cool also, some documentaries do that, but we felt like it wouldn't accentuate the, 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 the um, visuals as much if we did that. We felt that the visuals would stand out a lot more if we could capture the feeling and the sounds of that time. So that's why we took that approach. And did you use Definitely. like technology from that era to achieve that? Like how did, how did you do it technically? All kind of, I mean, we did it by every means necessary. But <laughs> 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 Definitely, well, well, I mean, the cool thing is that Paul and I have been recording so long that- I was gonna say, our, that I'm right, we've been doing it for so long. Yeah, <laughs> that, that our knowledge base goes back to analog. Like we're not digital cats. We're digital cats now because that's the mode of the times. But we started on two inch tapes. I mean, I started on a four track tape. So we understand like how to um, get the essence of dust and what kids now call lo-fi, yeah. you know, we just, we, they got a name for it now. They call it lo-fi. We're just like, oh, okay, it's just sampling records, but whatever. You know what I mean? So we, 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 we started with a palette, you know what I mean? We started with a palette, going through things and sounds and loops and, and instruments and whatever it is. And we, and we discarded anything that sounded too current and we kept anything that sounded dusty. You know what I mean? And that's what we pulled from as far as a palette was concerned. You know, you mentioned how far the both of you go back. And, you know, I can't think of, of many folks that go back 40 years, all of these different iterations of groups and projects and opportunities to work together. I'm curious to know, just in your own words, like what is the glue that holds Prince Paul and Newkirk together, not personally, but creatively? Like you guys collaborate so well together. Uh, I, I'd have to say for me, if you talk about not personal, but this is still personal, is, is uh, we love music and we love honesty in music and we love being creative uh, and we speak the language of music. You know, it, it's especially when we first met each other, it was like, hey man, how you doing? Yo, you seen that new mixer? You heard that new breakbeat? You heard that 24 <laughs> seven music, 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 music. You know, so how's your family doing? They're good. Yo, you see that red? You see that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you that new MPC like that came out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, it's, uh, we speak the language of music and that's what really keeps us going. You know, like, I mean, now obviously, like I said, trying to take personal, personal stuff out of it, uh, aside from us being brothers and, and being through so much and supportive and family, blah, blah, blah. You know, music is always that bonding 
point that we could always go back to. And love you know, the love of music. What about you, Don? Um, definitely the same thing, Paul. Echoing the same thing, Paul. For me, it's hard to take the personal aspect out of it because I've known Paul so long and I don't see a, a separation between the personal and the music because our personal relationship, relationship started musically. Mm. You know what I mean? Like in ninth grade, I'm looking at this dude in, in class <laughs> and he had his shirt on that said DJ Paul and I'm <laughs> fresh out the Bronx in, in Amityville. And, you know, I, I went to who I could uh, identify with most, which was the thuggiest cat in the class. And I'm like, yo, who's that dude, man? Who's this guy, DJ Paul? He's like, oh, man. Oh, he's dude, a cornball. He, he said, hey, yo, he's the illest DJ in Amityville, man. I'm like, what? With a name like DJ Paul? <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't get it because, you know, I'm Kid Wonder. I'm coming from the Bronx with Grandmaster Flash, all these flowery, you know, big names. And he was like, yo, trust me, son. That that dude right there is ill. So our the initial relationship started over music. I went and introduced myself, you know, to, to understand who this dude was. Like, yo, yo wait, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. You got the opportunity to say my part. Let me let me explain how I met you. <laughs> hey, <go ahead. laughs> yo, he came up, he was like, yo, man, I'm from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> take 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 the head wrap off. Take the you know I the, 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 the nice you know the 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 the, the, the whole tech beard and you know, all the nice look, nice look. Yo, right. it was mock definitely neck that. on leaves. You know, head to the side. Yo, what's, what's up? Bronx? I'm Kid Wonder from the Bronx. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That, that whole bravado. I was like, what? <laughs> and that's how he looked at me too. Paul kind of looked up like. <laughs> Who's this guy? <laughs> so here I'm the cornball, and he is the cool hard dude from the Bronx. We meet together at last in, yeah. in gym class or wherever you was at. Yeah. I think it was like either math or science or something like that. Yeah, it was some class, man. And um, yeah, and I, I invited him over, man, because I was like, yeah, you know, I got my turntables at the crib, got my drum machine, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I, I invited him over, man, to come over and with with the with the intention of battling him, DJing wise, so I'm gonna battle him, take him out. And then he came over and was, he was nice. Yeah. I was like, wow, he knows all the tricks that I know, and I'm from the Bronx. How is this? <laughs> <laughs> How did all of that reach out here? Yeah. <laughs> How did all that get to Amityville already? Like, this is possible. He's spinning behind his back too. <laughs> Oh you no! Know, well, hold on, let me. I'm sorry, I'm gonna go yeah, yeah, yeah. every late. Yeah, he's DJing. He's cutting breaks. And I was like, oh. Then we start doing the the, the DJ train going back yep. and forth. I oh, think no. that was the bonding oh, moment. Oh, it's like, oh, oh, yep. oh we can oh. catch it too. Let me catch it a little faster. Good, yeah. good, good. So right. Right. <laughs> right. I think the I think the only thing maybe, the only thing I had as a one up, was that I knew that that um funky drummer that funky drummer cut that mm. the one yeah. two three yeah. four and i could make it go four three two <laughs> one two three that's that dope. was the only thing i had <laughs> everything else i was like this guy knows everything else <laughs> yeah that's what i was gonna it. ask if y'all remember any of the records you played that day oh it was uh, all, it was the all classics. break beats yeah, yeah all, all break classics beats. yeah mm. yeah because my thing was Pussyfooter still. Yeah, that was his oh. song. Love Pussyfooter, man. Woo! <laughs> you, uh, Frisco Disco. You mentioned yeah. names. I mean, you know, you guys were the Soul Brothers, you know, when you met as a group, you know, as adolescents, basically, teenagers. This album, you know, the score is released under the Lord Brothers. Just tell me about that progression. Is that an homage to kind of where you started? Kind of. Ah. Kind of. I mean, it was never um, formalized. I don't think we ever formalized. We formalized the Soul Brothers. The Lord Brothers was never formalized. It just kind of came about as something that we spoke about every now and then. Um, I, I, Paul might have more insight on it. But yeah, I don't think it was ever formalized as we are the Lord Brothers. I think it was just more <laughs> so that we felt like, you know, this was an ordained for us to know each other and for us to do music together. So. Mm. You know, it's kind of like the Lord brought us together and, you know, 
Word. We're going to start a group called Lord Brothers, where I was going to be Lord, <laughs> I was going to be Lord Newkirk, and he was just going to be the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too late. It's not too late. <laughs> You're right. And, and, and let, let me let me add. At that point, now we had the Soul Brothers since what, 81, 82? Oh, yeah. Yeah. From that point on, the Soul Brothers have been used a billion times, so we couldn't mm -hmm. even use it if we wanted to anyway. <laughs> so right. it was just like, right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So y'all connected first uh, to, the, to the outside world on uh, talking all that jazz. Uh, so, you know, that was also, that's an original baseline, right? Still one of the funkiest baselines out, period, right? No samples or anything. It had a James Brown vibe to it. it what, what was the influence behind that, 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 uh, those keys on that? Um, that was, that was delight. That was delight. <laughs> well, yeah. can, I, can I start the story? And, and yeah, yeah you, you tell the story well. All right, so, so check it out. You know, obviously I've been in the group sets of Sonic. They're like, yo, we need somebody to play keys on this. That's my best delight impression in 1987, <laughs> six or whatever it was. We need somebody to play keys on this. I'm like, oh, my friend, he's nice. Because usually we get DBC to play stuff, but I think this was a little bit out of DBC's realm at the time, because DBC will play like certain melodies and stuff. But I knew Newkirk, he's in his basement getting it in. Plus it was an opportunity to put my friend on. Because I always bowed in my head, even though they didn't ask me, I never said I'd do this. Like, yo, any chance I got on, if I get on, I'm putting my friends on. It's somehow, some way. Yo, Newkirk, now mind you, I'm on the phone, the, the uh, no. Kid Wonder, I think was it. Yo, Kid Wonder, yo, Wonder. Yo, Wonder. Yo, uh, yo, and he's coming out of the studio and play a bass line. I don't know, Delight got some idea in his head. But I said you could do it. So can you come down to Calliope Studios in Manhattan, uh, you know, blah, 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 day and come through? Yeah, I can come through. Now, my, now keep in mind, I couldn't stay on the phone too long because that's when phone calls weren't cheap. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right, second link. <laughs> Now you can take it from there, Ducker. Yeah, so <laughs> showed up at the studio and um, Delight was like, yo, I got this bass line that go like this. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, do that again? <laughs> he had to do it like at least four times, you know what I mean? I was like, man, this is, this is a challenge. So I started messing around with it. I remember it was a DX7. Um, and um, I started messing with it, and he was like, no, 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 not like that. I said, just do it again, just keep doing it. And the more he did it, the more I kind of picked up on the rhythm of it, and I kind of came up with my own interpretation of what he was doing, and, um, and then I caught it, and he said, yeah, 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 that's it. Yo, that's it right there, that's it. So we laid it, and this was like, not before sequences, there were definitely sequences, but this is when we were like, you know, raw dog analog to the core, man. <laughs> Hit record, and I played that bass line straight through from the beginning to end. Because he's nice. Because he's new, Kurt. <laughs> and then, and then um, went back, and um, he was good with that. But I was like, man, I need something more. You know what I mean? And Paul was like, hey, whatever you feel, new, Kurt. Hey, you know. keep, hey, can I add this? Yeah, I yeah. laid the beat down first before he laid the Oh, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. I had to do it to the beat. Wait, wait, hold, hold, hold. I'm just saying that because we're not credit with any production on that record. Oh, we get no credit. <laughs> this, is, this is the game. At the all. <laughs> we were paying our dues. Yeah, um, yeah. You talked to Tommy about that, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so I laid the bass line, and then um, I was like, man, it needs something else, though, you know. So I, I put some chords down, just some like eerie chords with, with, the, with the keys again. And then Paul was like, yo, that's, that's dope. He was like, yo, do like a little lead line. Just like a little lead solo line. I was like, okay, cool. And um, grabbed it, I'm back to the synth and pulled up a little horn patch and played it from the top and just started jamming, man. And that da da da, ba 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 came out and Paul was like, yo, 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 that's it. And Delight was like, yeah, yeah, that's crazy, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was three tracks, three takes, probably some of the fastest recording I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to tell you, man, that's what was dope about back then, man. It's like, 
there was no time to be second guessing and like overthinking and like, I'm gonna change the sound or I don't like this. Or I, it was just like, is it hot? Record it. Hey, studio Yo, $50, it. $60 an hour. You had to be. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that tape was $100 yep. a reel, $120 That's right. a reel. And I laid that, laid that lead line and um, that was it. It was three takes. Listen back to it, sounded dope. And um, everybody was happy, including me. I was like, cool, man. I just yeah. recorded a record. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and then it came out, and then y'all didn't put me in the video. I was really hurt. <laughs> hey, hey, look, don't, don't say y'all. Remember, I'm, I'm, the t I'm the teenager of the group. Because I, like, so. I was like, the video was so, the video was so dope because they was in a jazz club. Yeah, yeah. I was like, man, I'm supposed to be on the keys in the jazz club, man. Like with my little glasses <laughs> on and my little beatnik hat. That was totally up my alley, you know. But yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was the beginning, man. That was like early. Yeah. Fat Five Freddy directed that video, by the way. Oh, Did he really? Yeah. Shout out to Fred. Yeah. You know, um, Paul from from De La Soul to Grave Diggers to Handsome Boy Modeling School, Prince Among Thieves. Your music has often been, you know, conceptual as well as cinematic. Are your ideas um, typically both audio and visual when you start to create a project? Everything is audio visual <laughs> because everything I make is pictures in my head first. You know, mm. it's like, ooh, that's crazy. Oh, yeah. And then it comes out musically. You know, it, it's, it's funny when before Pro Tools and we talked about analog and and uh, and how we record is, is tape, and you know we look at numbers and everything. And I'm sure Newkirk has, does this too, or, or did this. We've seen pictures of the music in our head when we lay it down, and how it looks. And so when you see Pro Tools, I'm like, wow, that's kind of close to what I was thinking in my head. You yeah. know, when when <laughs> music becomes a picture, you know, you know, um, and laying things down. So yeah, it, it works hand in hand. You know, and a lot of it is just personality driven. It's whatever I'm feeling at the time. You know. I create whatever in, in my head and then try to figure out how does it work musically. And Parliament Funkadelic had a lot to do with that because they mm. did a lot of conceptual records. They were in space, they were underwater, they went all these different places. And so my early production technique was all stemmed from listening to that like a madman, like constantly from being a child to, you know, adulthood, even to nowadays. So. Definitely. You know, you're often uh, credited as the inventor of skits. Right? Yikes. <laughs> you know, the, the, the De La album, you know, whether you're the first or not, it was revolutionary, right? You know, it was the thing that put it on the map. What, what gave you the idea, uh, you, or you guys the idea to, to do that, right? Because, you know, it was unlike anything that had been heard before. Um, I think a, a lot of it is just, we were just always thinking left. And I think that's where I, kind of didn't fit in Stet. Like, Stet is, is, is my heart and my band and the first group I've been in and they gave me an opportunity. But some of the things that I was thinking were not, did not work with that, with that group. Because, and I say this again, of who I am and how my brain works and the fact that I was a lot younger than those guys, still am a lot younger than those guys. <laughs> <laughs> that has <hasn't> to <laughs> Um you know, it just didn't apply. So when I met De La, it's like those guys were rebels themselves and thinking left and sounding left. It's like, it's like meeting your, you know, like we just mirrored each other. It's like meeting your match. You're like, oh my God, where have you been? You know, that's crazy. Check this idea. We're just like impressing each other and, and amazing at each other at the same time. Like, oh my God, that's crazy. And as Newkirk knows, growing up, man, like I'll instigate anything. They're like, I hear him do a cough. I'm like, yo, record that. Record the cough. Record it. Record it. I'm recording everything. I'm trying to come up with every idea and, and get them to do stuff and experiment and just push the envelope because it's almost like, uh, now, I, now I see it psychologically. It's almost like when you're in some type of relationship or something and somebody doesn't allow you to do something, but now you have the opportunity, you broke up and you're like, what? I'm, I'm, you didn't let me drink. I'm drinking every day. <laughs> So I just went off the deep end with Dayla. So all of the stuff I felt I couldn't do instead, I'm like, yo, let's do it, let's do it, let's record it. Because there were times where I'm like, yo, let me do it. And they were like, uh, and I'm like, all right, I'll just sit here. <laughs> in the studio in the corner with the Dutch hat on, you know? And so 
now I had the opportunity to do these things and these guys listened to me what <laughs> so it, it was it, you know it, it was beautiful and and yeah. I'll say this again every opportunity I call new Kirk he's the yeah. he's the guy at the end of the album <laughs> yeah yeah, and, I mean, and with the skits, you know. Yeah, did did you have any idea when you were participating, Don, how iconic that was going to become? No, no, of course not. <laughs> we, were just, we were just hanging out, man. Like, you know, what I mean, it was just like, man, Paul would be like, "Yo, I'm going to the studio tonight with Daylight. You want to come through? Yeah, I'll be there." You know what I mean? And we would just hang out, man. And then when the skits happened, it, it was just so organic. You know what I mean? It was just like. Paul gets in his head and starts, you can tell, because you see him start thinking, and then he laughs to himself. He's like, <laughs> he starts laughing to himself. Yo, that he's is like, me. Oh, okay. That's funny. He's got an idea. <laughs> and um, the idea came out, and it was like, oh, okay. And it just, it wasn't even like it's so heavily thought out. It was just like, yo, you're going to be this person, and you're going to be that person. <laughs> and even the engineer got in on it. Like, ah. <laughs> Game show Al, Funk Me Watts, man. He, he, he's the dude that introduces the album. Wow. To Welcome to Three Feet High and Rising. You know, that's Al in the beginning. So since they had Al started off, they were like, man, we need somebody to finish it now. And I just happened to be sitting there. Paul was like, Newkirk, why don't you be the dude to finish off the album? You, you know, you do like an announcer voice. And you can finish it off. So, so those weren't like, voices. Okay, that you like, had. All right, cool. So I channeled my inner Don Pardo. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was, Don Pardo. Really listen to it. It's really just a Don Pardo impersonation. Wow. And um, tell them what they won, Don. And then I just went into that. It was it was really just, it could have been anybody who was in the studio that day, really, <laughs> would have got that job. It just was that I happened oh, to be there. Oh, no, don't, don't minimize your... <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, I was perfect for it. I was definitely perfect for it. You know, for but, those who um, don't know, who's Don Pardo? Don Pardo was um, the announcer on a bunch of shows, but his main show was um, um, what's it? What's what's Saturday not, what's Night Live? Fun? Huh? He did Saturday Night Live. I know that, right? He did Saturday Night Live. That was the big one, but he did other stuff also. But yeah, I know him from Saturday Night Live. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I was I was channeling my inner Don Pardo because that was all I knew <laughs> as an announcer. That's all I had, really. It was that guy was saying that live. It was like, oh, no. So, 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 so. so, so I said, all right, well, 2000 would have been Michael Buffer. He, we, the skits would have sounded totally different. <laughs> right. And it's, it's crazy because I remember, like, they sat and wrote those questions really quick. And they were like, everybody was, like, giggling in the studio. They were like, Nobody's gonna be able to answer these questions. How many times did the Batmobile catch a flat? Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. It was, it was every definitely spontaneous. And it was very Kirk's, spontaneous. Kirk's right. You know, I get in my head and I'm like, "Yo, you do this, you do this." I'm dipping out things, and that's like I said, that's the beauty of it. I was like, "Wow, people are listening to me." You don't understand like what the feeling is of you feeling like, like I said, like Newkirk met me, DJ Paul, and you kind of get that vibe. You kind of your whole life, you're like, who are you? And so I had to sit there and kind of prove myself, but now I got somebody to listen to me and not question what I'm doing. Oh, it was beautiful. Oh, you, just, you know, I just divvy out the what to do and they do it and I record it. That is yeah. fun. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do that nowadays, but I will <laughs> <No. do that. laughs> So, I mean, given all the, the projects that you guys have done together, I was playing the Baby Elephant album a lot this, this week. Um, how do you know, I mean, obviously, you know, how do projects kind of start? And then how do you know when they're done? <laughs> There's so many ways to, to, to answer that. Uh, sometimes uh, when you just can't, you, you'll know, you'll sit there and like, yo, you start adding stuff and it makes the song worse. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, let's scale it back. It's good where it's at. The other one is when the label says, look, we got to have this done by June the 3rd, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, then, you know, the other one is you might have another project coming up, you know, right after. But a lot of it is just, I mean, for me personally, it's you can hear, you can feel it. And I know, like I said, when I keep adding, 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 and, and it's taking away from the song, I'm like, oh, this is too much. Let me scale it back. It's good right there. And then, you know, there's times where I'll gauge it off my friends. You know, I'll play something, you know, check this, you know, check it out. 
And if they're and if somewhere in the middle of the song, they go, hey, man, did you watch that? I'm like, oh, I lost them. I lost them right about one minute, 32 seconds. All right, let me, you know, let me work this. You know, when somebody from beginning to end is just intense and just like, oh, my God, oh, then I know the song is right when I engage it off of other people. Newkirk, what, what do you, what do you, what do you, how do you, how do you gauge it? Yeah, yeah, definitely what Paul said. It's like, it's definitely like cooking. You know what I mean? Like when you're cooking and uh, if you're the type of cook that wings it like I do, I don't really mess with recipes too much. I'm just like, oh, I got some peppers and some onions and some garlic and some chicken. I'm going to make this happen. You know, at some point you're tasting it and you're like, ooh, this is good. It just needs a little bit more of whatever. And if you go over that point, You'll be like, oh, messed it up. Still good. Out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's still good. And you eat it and it goes down right. But it's not like if you'd have just left it alone at that point where you tasted it and it was like, woo, this is bomb. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely like Paul said, like, you know, not going overboard. You know, that's how you know when it's done. A lot of times when it starts, it starts different ways. Like with the Bernie project with Baby Elephant. You know, Paul was dead set about getting Bernie's musical history on wax. You know what I mean? He was like, Bernie's so much more than just Parliament Funkadelic. You know what I mean? This guy's classically trained. He could play jazz. He could, you know, God bless him. He could, he could play anything. And Paul wanted to, you know, I mean, look, I didn't even pay any mind to that group called the Talking Heads. Not that they weren't good, just wasn't my bag until Bernie got down. And that album was like monumental for me. It was like, yo, this is incredible. And at the time, I didn't even realize it was Bernie Worrell that made me love the Talking Heads. Mm. You know what I mean? So Paul wanted to showcase definitely all those different sides of Bernie. So. That was, that was the initial start of how we started it. So it was like approaching Bernie and being like, do, almost doing an interview. Mm. And tell us about your life, slugger. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> tell us about your career, slugger. <laughs> and then he would tell us something and then Paul would be like, yeah, like, how does that sound if you were to play it? And then he would just go boom, boom. And we'd be like, oh, and we catch That's it. it. That's it. So That's that cool. was definitely the baby elephant thing was us trying to, to capture as, as many sides of Bernie that we could. Um, so, so, you know, yeah, I, so I think we did a no kid job. Oh, yeah. So much of the hip hop of that era was, was based on, you know, Parliament Funkadelic, James Brown, things like that. And I know that it was a mixed kind of reaction from that generation as to how hip hop was using the music. What, what was his reaction to, to, to hip hop generally? And like, how did you guys kind of like, you know, bridge those two generations in your relationship with him? You yeah, can answer, I, I Paul. I think he loved it though. I think he loved hip hop. I think because he just loved music. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree. I mean, you know, honestly, I've never gotten into a deep hip hop conversation with him. Like, what do you think of this person? What do you think of that person? It was really, honestly, me fanning out. Oh my God, this is Bernie Warrell. Oh my God. You know, because you got to remember, I'd said from my childhood, this is all I listened to. I almost failed sixth grade because I listened to one album and played hooky from school for about a month and some change. So, which, which, it, album, which album was that? It was Motor Booty Affair came oh, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, so I was just, oh, I know that album inside, all the little quirks and sounds. And to this day, I listen to it on every flight I take, right? <laughs> so, you know, I'm fanned out. So I could care less about hip hop. I'm trying to... Anytime I work with anybody who is um, knowledgeable and who is like a, a, a legend and my senior and everything, I'm trying to learn as much. Uh, you know, they could ask me whatever, but most of the time I'm just asking questions. Like Newkirk said, it's like an interview. You sit there like, what's this? And what's it? And I'm asking, 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 trying to learn, trying to learn, trying to learn. Um, you know, it, it's like free college. You know, a lot of these albums I, I'd practically do, you know, if I have the time, do for nothing, just for the, for the learning part of it. Like, you know, that's invaluable to, to, to work with somebody like him. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of that is, is just, you know, me, less of the hip-hop part, but me trying to 
get him to do his thing. And then I add the hip hop to it and see if he goes, you know, yay or nay. If he's like, oh yeah, okay. And usually the hip hop part is just funky drums. Once you put drums under anything, you know, it, 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 that's the hip hop test. It, it turns, it twists the sound of anything you make. So like, in, and that, that's a good example of that album. You know, we did, didn't, didn't he have the, uh, what was that piano, Newkirk, the, with, the, with the Western thing we did? Oh, the upright piano? Yeah, the upright piano. That's the loom, that's the loom yeah. piano. That was a, man, that album, ooh, man, that project in general is one of my favorite projects that we've done, definitely. I mean, obviously because it's Bernie Worrell. I remember when Paul called me about it. <laughs> Paul called me and was like, yo, you want a job? You want to work? Because <laughs> that's how he always does. He doesn't start with... He doesn't start with the project. He starts with, you know, are you busy and do you want to work? Like, yeah, I want to work. I'm like, wow, what's up? He said, I do this project with Bernie, Bernie Worrell. You down? It's like, man, stop asking me if I'm down. That's Bernie Worrell, man. <laughs> All you got to do is call me and say, look, be on the moon at 7 o'clock on Friday. We're working with Bernie. And I'm going to find, you know, a SpaceX flight to the moon if I have to, to get there and work with Bernie. So... You know, I was down. All he had to do was say, Bernie, and I was in. But the project, man, from where we recorded it at, um, the studio itself, Bernie himself just being Bernie, such a warm, loving soul. Oh, he's um, the best dude, man. Oh, my God. Definitely loved educating and, you know, making sure you learned something. Very um, humble. Very humble. Um, I only have one regret from that album. It's not a big one, but only one is that I didn't have a camera phone at the time um, because he did show me, he did dial up the patch on the mini move for, for flashlight. And I tried to, um, I tried to internalize it the best I could, but I didn't have a camera phone to take a picture of it. Wow. Um, wow. Um, and it wasn't what I thought actually, like when he, when he brought up the sound, you know, cause that's all synth heads, man. We're all like, man, how do you make that sound? You know what I mean? Um, so when he dialed it up, I was like, really? I was like, like that? Like, that's not what I would have thought that sound was. But now when I listen to it, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what he did. Um, but yeah, the learning experience, man. And that piano that Paul's talking about, we recorded that in Lenny Kravitz's old studio. Um, and he had this upright piano. And we recorded the song, Turn My Teeth Up. Um, and it was this riff I came up with at home, the doom, 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 and gave it to Bernie, and I was all terrified, like, oh my God, I'll come up with this riff, and I have to play it for Bernie Worrell, he's gonna think I'm whack. <laughs> <laughs> played the riff for him, and he was like, oh, I like that. He said, that's cool, man. And then we went and recorded it, and when we recorded it, it was crazy, because the piano was so janky and old, the, 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 the hammers used to stick. Like when you press a key, the hammer would hit the key, but it would stick and not pull back. So when we recorded it, I had to stand over Bernie. Yeah, I forgot about over, this. <laughs> over the piano. <laughs> and and as he was playing it, <laughs> I'd have to reach my finger in while he's playing it and pull these hammers back so he could continue playing live. And... Um, <laughs> It was fun but that. terrifying because it was like, don't get your get finger your caught. Hammer. <laughs> don't get that finger caught in that hammer, bro. That's true. Forgot about and that. And it was That's wild true. because it was wild. He took that one little riff I did and he breaks off into the song. And there's a part in the song where he goes into like a bridge part. And then he goes into like a real saloon. Oh, the saloon joint. Yeah, the saloon man, that's part. amazing. And it was so, to be standing over him, watching him do this while I'm pulling out these hammers, but to watch <laughs> him do it was so wild to me because I had no idea from this little riff that he could take this one little riff and turn it into so much. You know what I mean? And he did it like off the cuff. He didn't have to think about it. He just went into this whole saloon thing, you know, the dun, 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 the whole nine. And it was just like amazing, like, and you know, the biggest lesson I got from Bernie was that, which is why I know he loved hip hop, 
is that everything is relative in music. Mm -hmm. Everything. Doesn't matter if it's classical, jazz, hip hop, rock, it's all relative. Which is why, because I asked him how he did it. I was like, well, how'd you take that riff? And how'd you take that one little riff and then go to, you know, sorry, I just forgot my notifications. Um, I was like, how'd you take that one little riff and then take it to so many places and then into the saloon? He said, man, because everything's relative. He says, it's not about style, man. It's, it's everything is styleless when you realize the relative nature of, of everything in music. And I was just like, Phew. wow. You know, that's, that's, that's crazy because, you know, I was, I was thinking earlier, when you think about hip hop, you know, from 1988 to 1995 or so, you know, obviously it's a spectrum. There are a lot of like diverse sounds. But I would say uh, on the opposite end of those spectrums are sonically, at least, and thematically are uh, Three Feet High and Rising and Grave Diggers, you know, uh, yet they came from the same mind, you know, in part. So <laughs> how, how did that happen? Because I know you were out of that, that Stetson box by the time you got to De La, which you, right. you know, to a whole different place with, with Grave Diggers. So, so how did that happen? Uh, man, it, it's life, you know, it, it, it's the one thing uh, about what I do and it's very dangerous is I reinvent myself often, even if, the last thing I did is successful. And I don't repeat the same thing over and over again because I'm so into like, this is where my mind's at now. This is where I've gone. This is what I've experienced. And I need to somehow showcase this in this next project that I'm doing. Cause this is where my emotions are. And man, when I did the grave diggers, man, the, the, life happened. I, I shot to the top, number one record, number one album. Uh, they love me. And then in a matter of a few years, yeah, oh, man, you can't hire Paul, man, because he fell off. And I was like, what? What happened? I, I don't expect people to love me for life. But I was like, yo, this is music industry. This is where, you know, when I'm high and hot, you know, my calls get answered. But when I'm not, nobody picks up. And it just it blew my mind because I was, a, you know, I was a kid. I was young. And, I, and, and it really put me into a dark place. And that's when I called uh, RZA, who, well, he was Prince Rakim then, who was going through it. He just got out of jail. Um, Poetic was homeless. Juan, I don't know what, I think he was making clothes or something. It was just something, everybody was so downtrodden. I was like, yo, I got this idea. They'll never hold, hold us down. We're gonna, da, da, da. We'll show them. And that pulled out that dark side of the music or just that, that kind of feeling of I'll show them. So yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it rises in waves. You can usually tell what's going on in my life just based on the music I make, if you know me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's always, something going on and I make those records and like I said it's dangerous because I go from place to place to place and at the same time when you go and you do stuff that's so diverse you're putting yourself up for some serious criticism you know so it's like you know people can really I, I could lose everyone on this one you know what I'm saying like it, it's like investing in like pork bellies is it and I put all my money into this and like and I'm sitting there like this like ah, I'm waiting for the stock to go up <laughs> Either it's going to hit or it's not going to hit, it, you know. And so, it, but it's, it, you know, that's the fun part of it. I, I think that's, to me, it, it, it's, uh, that's where you just, you're being you. And that's where I can see who really likes me for me. I know it sounds cheesy, but that's kind of the test. Who's riding with me? Who's not riding with me, you know? And I take those risks. <laughs> and I think, hence, like you said, you know, from 88 to, 94 when we did the grave diggers um i just try to take every project and try to push as much diversity in my uh in my discography as possible i think uh, and and i could say this and i and maybe you could correct me i don't know if any hip-hop based producer has done much diverse music as i have as far as just like styles comedy records children's records scoring t you know TV stuff, you know, uh, XM radio. Like I go all over the place just to see if I can do it. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And for the experience. And the, may, hey, maybe I fail. If I do fail, I learn from it. And then I, and it gives me an idea for the next thing. But I just don't want to sit down and just be scared. And, you know, oh, they're going to hate me. They're not going to like me. You know, people are not going to like you anyway. <laughs> a lot of reason not to like you, but I want to be liked and not liked on my own terms, and so I push the, the envelope. And then here I call my faithful friends, 
Don Newkirk, <laughs> my boy B Most, everybody I went to school with, you know, and I and I keep it pushing. You know, it's it's, it's crazy. I, I, there's only one other producer who I can think of who has that same kind of diversity in sound and projects. Not a hip hop producer, uh, Quincy Jones. Oh yeah, but I, oh man, yeah, Quincy Jones, man, like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty good company. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, I, I've never thought of that, and and I would never put my name nowhere near Quincy Jones. But I just did. That's, I, I, I that, take that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Quincy Jones is is all over the place. I had the pleasure of meeting him at uh at the Jazz Fest. Yo, it, that was hanging out with Quincy Jones. Man, he's wild. You know what I'm saying? Like, I thought he's like, so it's like, oh, the old man, this is Quincy Jones. Oh my God. He was sitting there like, ah, we're laughing, we're snapping on people on the stage. I was like, yo, he's like me. <laughs> and if there's a picture on my Instagram or somewhere of me and him, and it's just me and him just like hanging out, like, ah. So he was snapping on people. You know what I'm saying? Like, hard body. We're just getting in, just digging on people. I was like, yo, he is all right. Yo, Prince Paul, you want some just to throw the fish? Ah. <laughs> like, it's like, nah, I'm good. It's like, more for me. Uh, look at that girl over there. You know, we were just, just getting in on people. I was like, well, he's all right, man. You know, good dude. So, yeah. Hey, did, 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 did Quincy give you the uh, secret to staying young? <laughs> the secret to staying young? Nah, he, we didn't yeah. get that far I, in the conversation. I heard it from somebody that he told somebody um, the secret to the way he stays young is that you never date. He said, you and the woman you're dating, your ages should never reach 100. Oh, snap. <laughs> I was like, whoa, I was like, whoa. The older crazy. you get, the younger you got to date? Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's why he always dates these young girls, man. Like, that's so I'm crazy. like, by that matter, he has to date a 16 year old now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> You know, yeah, you know what I mean? Niggas dangerous, niggas right. dangerous. <laughs> But you know, it kind of makes sense to a degree. I was like, wow. <laughs> if you and your girl equal 103, man, it might be a problem. Time to end it. That's funny. Paul, you mentioned, uh, you, mentioned, that. you mentioned photographs. I've always wanted to ask you, you know, there's a photograph of you oh, and God. L and Tupac. And oh, it yeah. Might, it might have been one of those things, like at a Jack the Rapper of like a quick flick. But is there, do you remember like what transpired to get the three of you? And, and there's somebody else in the photo, too. Um, oh, my man, the beast. Okay. See, that's another one of my friends, man. Okay. You know, I, I hire him all the time to do stuff. Yeah, that's, yes, it's my good friend, Joe East. They call him the beast. Yeah, um, man, I vaguely remember that picture. I think it was outside somewhere in Manhattan. It was somebody's, uh, if I remember correctly, somebody's release party or something. And it was just like, yo, what's up? Oh, let's take this picture. You know, and then it's, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ernie. What's it? Uh, oh, P. N. Coley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's take this picture. So we're all together, like, hey, you know. What happened before or after that, I don't remember. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, but I'm glad he took the picture, <clears throat> you know. I'm glad he took the picture. Did, and, you, uh, did you know Pac? Did you interact with him at all? Or, like, was that your only? Oh, it's just idle conversation and yeah. disrespect, you know. Yeah. Man, I respect your work. I love you too. Oh, man, I love what you do. Oh, man. And that's when he gets, yo, let's take this picture. You know what I'm saying? And we all, you know, everybody knows Dell. You know, he's just like, you know, that guy that kind of like, you know him too? Yeah. <laughs> so kind of, it kind of all worked out. And yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's funny. I'm, I'm glad that picture was, was documented, you know? Yeah. You know, so as we wind down, I want to bring it back to the project. Um, you know, you talk about your catalog and the, the song, the songs that you've worked on. One of the ones you worked on that was, super radical at the time uh but I'm, I'm curious to both of your thoughts on its themes in this present day was karis one's drug dealer oh yeah, yeah drug dealer yeah you know where he's really talking about you know uh, nobody ever talks about to that, rise so. up you know so we can and organize your business so that we can rise up so what do you um think about those themes of self-empowerment now as a juxtaposition to like what's going on in the country wow yeah you know Karis one obviously is, is, is always been that guy to, especially when we did that record. He was like, "Yeah, Paul, I do this record, drug dealer." And I'm like, "Yeah, cool." You know, who, who really says no to Karis one? I'm like, "All right, let me hear what you got." And he has books and books of rhymes, and he's and he's reciting it. And I'm like, "This ain't no I'll battle you. I'm the best rapper party thing." I was like, "He's he's getting really serious with this," and. 
it's amazing at the time, I really didn't think much of it because I was really so focused on performance, what the beat was, and, let, and I'll tell you a little side story that has, that has nothing to, to, something to do with this. I never got a chance to finish that record. You know, when we just talked earlier about like finishing stuff and you know mm -hmm. when it's done, uh, I went to finish it and I couldn't find him anywhere. And next thing I know, the record is out. And I'm like, oh, that's not the record. That's not uh, it. It's oh, not it. it wow. My name is on it, but that's how it's supposed to sound. <laughs> so wow. there's a there's a real version. <laughs> then there's the record <laughs> version. But um, yeah, I mean, he was right. And he was talking about that all the time, even, even before that record. It, you know, and, and that was really... I remember in a lot of forums and stuff, because we were, especially being with Stetson Sonic, a lot of us public enemy, was always get your own, build your own, you know, and so you can control it. And slowly but surely in the music business, people started to wise up. Maybe not in all businesses, but I know definitely in the music business, people started to kind of go, okay, I want my masters. Oh, what's this, what's this publishing thing? Oh, what's this? Oh. Then the, the the internet comes about. Oh, okay. So he talked about it, but it was a radical move to actually do it. And it and it like I said, it started happening. And he he had the idea, and in some cases led by example, you know. Um, and it's funny, like I said, I never really thought about the words until you mentioned because nobody ever. You're probably the first person in my history of ever doing interviews asked me about drug dealing. Like nobody asked me about that record, <laughs> ever. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Yo, like ever. Oh man, Karis won't apologize. By the way, for for ducking me. Yeah, yeah. That's what, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just want to put a nice neat bow on it. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, those themes are like you know we talk about um, what's happening, and you know that's that's Malcolm talked about that. You know, every revolutionary has talked about empowering yourself not looking to others you know like uh so uh yeah it, it struck me as being very very relevant to this project you guys have created yeah it, wow man you really you guys really piece stuff together you know and, and it's funny i make these records and i didn't even even think of that you know uh listen to drug dealer yeah it's it's these times man it, it's uh and I don't want to get real deep into it because then i'll probably sit there and start crying <laughs> you know like oh man these times <laughs> It's, 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 it's not surprising what's happening, but it's so much, man. I, I mean, you can attest to this, man. Like, I think we're in a sweet spot at this age to see so much change. And from technology to music to, you know, what was, what was bad back in the day is now good nowadays. Like, just how things have just changed, you know? It, it's, you know when biting was a crime when I grew up. Now it's like, who's, your, who's that? Who's that record you? Who's the producer? I want to say, biting's not a crime anymore. Like everything is flipped. So it, 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 to me, sometimes I sit down and I go, whoa, what is going on? Am I that old man that's like, you know what I'm saying? This life is passing by, the, the 12 is blinking on the VCR. You know what I'm saying? How you program this? You know, like, <laughs> and the kids are like, VCR, what's that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Which really shows my age, you know. So, <laughs> you know, that was my last. That's my last question, though. Like, um, you know, you guys have put a lot of care and attention into creating physical, you know, vinyl and cassette copies of this album. You know, why is that still important in an age where everything is available to you digitally? It's real. It's it's it's. I don't know. It's physical. You know what I mean? Like, we're in such a a, a virtual world right now. Everything's so digital and can't put your hands on anything you know what i mean and it's it's besides the fact that there's all these vinyl collectors and people that are still into that it's definitely something that's like you can hold it in your hand yeah you know what i mean yeah, you I can agree. make a connection you can make a physical connection to it you know what i mean more than like what can you do with a digital download you got to pick your phone up you got to pick your computer or your ipad up to to have a connection with it and then it's just in the ethers. It doesn't really exist, actually. You know, I mean, if there's some giant crash tomorrow, you know, everything goes away. But if you got that physical copy, you're like, oh, still got my, my body means necessary. I'm good. You know what I mean? So it was definitely 
uh, an homage to hip hop, an homage to like the vinyl collectors, but definitely, you know, something tangible, man, that you can get your hands on. And, and you know, it's a collector's item also. I think it's definitely a sign of the times. We could have named it sign of the times if we knew what was coming. You know right. what I mean? We named it sign of the times too, because Prince had one of those. And um, to your question about self-empowerment and building our own, um, I feel for a lot of my young brothers and sisters because they feel like it's not worth it. Like I was having a conversation with my daughter the other day and her whole thing was like, it's just not worth it to even try to fight because the whole system is corrupt. And I'm like, nah, like that's all we have is our fight. That's it. If we, that's what they want. Like if we lose the fight with it, if we lose our internal ability to fight, it's over. It's literally completely done. And a lot, of the, a lot of the youth right now is like, ah, what's the sense of building your own? You build your own, they're going to rip it down like Black Wall Street. And, it, and it's really crazy that these protests were happening right on the anniversary of Tulsa and Black Wall Street. Like, I don't think there's any accidents. There's, I think that what we used to call the hidden hand is no longer hidden. You know, it's still hidden as far as who the actual players are behind the scenes. But I think that it's obvious now that there's, you know, an agenda. And it's definitely, you know, I don't want to get all extra revolutionary, but I can't help it. It's an agenda against the black man and woman in, in the world. It's not just in America. It's in the entire world. I'm still trying to find the papal decree in the 1200s where the Pope, after Spain fell and after the Moors fell, um, in Spain, where there was a papal decree that supposedly says we shall never allow them to rise again, ever. And if I find it, you know, I mean, I don't even think it's necessary to find it, really, because you can see the evidence of it everywhere. It's like, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. So now more than ever, self-empowerment is the only way out of this mess, I believe. It's not protesting in the street. I understand the frustration, I understand the anger, but that hasn't helped in 50 years. It's not going to start helping now. If anything, it's going to push the agenda faster into martial law and into what whoever the powers that be are, into what they want. So now is the time to take that same energy, that same fire that we have, and take it off the streets and take it into businesses and take it into corporations take it into building more and building with each other and amongst each other. And it's not a black thing. It's a, it's a, it's a human thing. It's everybody doing it together. You know what I mean? But for, for the, the melanin dominant people of the world, we definitely need our own thing. You know what I mean? So we can interface properly with the world. We're not interfacing properly with the world. I mean, they took the they took the uh, quarantine off in Atlanta, and everybody went and lined up for Jordans. Mm. Like I think wow. that, yeah. And there's a picture I didn't of know it. That. I think, yeah, and I think that says a lot about the, the 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 consciousness, the subconsciousness of the urban community. You know what I mean? I think we really need to refocus the subconscious mindset of the urban community. I don't want to get on a high horse and all that stuff. I'll save that for a YouTube channel or something. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think now more than ever, man, we really have to like think about and rethink about who we are and what we want and empowering ourselves with knowledge and, and making moves, man, together. Definitely. <sighs> Or, you know, I was, uh, I was with some younger brothers uh, a couple of days ago who had been out protesting. And, you know, I encourage it, it raises awareness, but I said to them that a lot of times people forget that in the 60s, accompanying the protests were the boycotts. There were people walking the work yeah. for a year. And that is what affected change. In the 80s, there were people who boycotted massive products to end apartheid. You know, Killer Mike called in 2016 for us to withdraw money from that capitalist system and put it into the black community, you know, circulate dollars in our community. So 
you know, we live in a capitalistic world and the economic impact is what drives real change. So uh, I feel you. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the album is By Every Means Necessary. The documentary is Who Killed Malcolm X? The album is out now. Uh, unlimited edition vinyl and cassette and available digitally on July 17th. Don Newkirk, Prince Paul, thank you both. We really oh man, thank you. Me. Yeah. We totally appreciate it. Absolutely. Definitely. Much love. And you can find you you can find me on uh, social media, just use my name, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, just Don Newkirk. Um, you can find the album on the lordbrothers.bandcamp.com. The cassettes are actually sold out. Um, we were serious about the limited edition. It's over after these vinyl, these last pieces of vinyl are gone. <clears throat> I think people are going to look back and go, whoa, I didn't realize how poignant this record was in this time. So I know, right? It's yeah. A, oof. yeah. Yeah. Something to get a hold of, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And the merch is coming soon. Oh. The merch will be up on by every means necessary dot com in the next five days. Cool. Also. Oh, cool. yeah. where can I reach you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> uh, every everything for me is at DJ Prince Paul. Cool. And uh and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> gentlemen thank you again yeah, thank you, thank you. All right. yeah. have a good one appreciate it you guys be safe out there man. Thanks, you too. thank you you too yeah.